mature adults have held on to their youth. By day, they are lawyers, teachers, and local merchants. By night, they form secret organizations to plan lavish balls and exotic parades so they can dress in colorful costumes and throw trinkets to millions of strangers. About 128,000 people participated in the parades, 981 floats, 586 bands. But Mardi Gras is not just a spontaneous party. It is dictated by a series of unwritten rules that have been passed down through generations. Rule number one, don't take yourself too seriously. Rule number two, dress accordingly. Rule number three, pace yourself. Rule number four, no violence or you will be immediately arrested. Rule number five, if you have beads, you can trade them for a look at these. Rule number six, everything ends at midnight on Fat Tuesday. Show your Bible. But oddly enough, the world's greatest party is based in religion. It always starts on January 6th, which is the Feast of the Epiphany. That's when the carnival season begins, and carnival is from the Latin carnival. I mean, ready for Orpheus 5! Are they in order? I'm called the, the captain of Orpheus. The captain is responsible for the, uh, the theme of the parade, uh, from uh, executing, making sure all the floats are, are uh, in line with that theme, uh, the ball that takes place afterwards, the celebrities, you name it, whatever takes place with the parade or the ball, the captain is ultimately responsible for it. It's now the final two days of the carnival season. In the next 48 hours, the biggest and the best of the Mardi Gras parades will roll through the city of New Orleans. Elaborate tractor-drawn floats are the centerpiece of every Mardi Gras parade, as they have been for over 120 years. The first documented float parade was in 1857 with the first carnival organization called the Mystic Crew of Comus. Why a float? I'm not really sure, except that it was almost a moving tableau, almost a, a play on wheels. Floats have evolved into technological wonders that require extensive design and construction. Floats today need to carry a lot more people, a lot more weight. There's animation on them, there's high-tech lighting, and we have to work uh, year-round to get all these floats ready. Brian Kern is a third-generation float builder. In 1947, his father established the Blaine Kern Company with six Mardi Gras floats. Today, the price of marching can be very high. This year, we're introducing a lot of fiber optics in the Mardi Gras, and one float for the crew of Orpheus, uh, the Leviathan, is going to have about $200,000 worth of lighting. It seemed ideal to have a long float, like a dragon. Then thinking about that and working that through over the years, it seemed like having a sea serpent added more to the, to the mytho mythological aspect, and so therefore the Leviathan was born. There is a practical side to float building as well. By law, a Mardi Gras parade cannot stop. So no matter how elaborate the design, they all need a bathroom. They're hidden in the design of the float. You'll see every float will have either something that looks like a tree trunk or a pillar or something in the center or at the back, and there's a, a door that you get in. The Orpheus floats begin to arrive at the New Orleans Convention Center eight hours before parade time. There, dozens of volunteers mobilize. It should be right in there. The biggest job by far is unloading trinkets by the truckload that will be thrown along the parade route. Our float has the best throws of all Mardi Gras. Hands I know down. we do. Hands down. Although Orpheus is only five years old, it has become a celebrity-studded event. This year, producer Quincy Jones, actor Forrest Whitaker, author Anne Rice, and Broadway star Tommy Toon will rule their own floats. It's a gumbo, man. It's a human gumbo. And that's an emotional, ritualistic gumbo. That's what it feels like. Let's get the sign board on. We're not pulling out until our sound system is on, all right? As parade time nears for the crew of Orpheus, Sonny makes final preparations. Meanwhile, hundreds of crew members are putting the finishing touches on their costumes. They're always different. 
are meant to match the float. Uh, and uh, I don't know, the trousers I think are made more for men. They're a little bit harder for us women, but we yeah, still deal with them. Front, but it do us I know, good, I know yeah. that zip in the front just doesn't do much, but. <laughs> Sonny gathers the crew of Orpheus for a final pep talk. We're gonna rock and roll! And we are reminded once again of Mardi Gras ties to religion. We always ask our God to bless us as we go out tonight. And I'm gonna ask Father Tom Hoffman to lead us in a prayer. Give us a safe ride this night. Allow us to be happy and wonderful and loving people to the people of New Orleans. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. <laughs> It's an hour before parade time, and all the pieces are in place. With the setting sun casting its golden light, the crew of Orpheus is towed through New Orleans to the Garden District, where the parade will begin. New Orleans has already parade route. There is time for one last break before rolling into history. As the sun sets on the New Orleans skyline, the flambeau torches are lit, and at 8.02, it's party time for Sonny and the crew of Orpheus. You're working. Your job is to get as many beads as possible to as many people as quickly as possible. out there begging for trinkets that, that are absolutely worthless, uh, but they but just must have them that, that particular time, and you're just granting their wish. Man. It's almost surreal, because all you can see is a sea of faces and, and hands, and, and everybody's yelling. In its simplest form, the Orpheus Parade is actually an elaborate carpool to transport the members of Orpheus from their parade staging area to their own lavish party at the New Orleans Convention Center. And all of these people dressed in their very expensive formal wear start acting like everybody you just saw on the street. bands playing, there's music going on, there's drink, there's food, and ladies in beaded gowns are on guys' shoulders yelling and screaming for bees, and you're just helping them, because these are your people, these are your guests. the city's European heritage is most obvious. Geographically, the French Quarter makes up only a tiny percentage of New Orleans, but it is ground zero for hundreds of thousands of partygoers. I'm from London, England. I'm from Orlando, Florida. Linwood, New Jersey. I came down from Mobile and enjoyed the Mardi Gras. We're here for the oh, good. educational experience of Mardi Gras. I came to visit some people in Florida and we're catching the plane here in New Orleans, so we'd stop by and see how it's going. I'm here because I'm local. I live here. I'm the state senator from this area. It's a class field trip. We're going to be tested on when we get home. Okay. The history, what it means to us. And it will not end until midnight. You'll have the state, the state police and the city police will come through here at midnight with the, with the police cars and the sirens shutting everything down on Fat Tuesday, and then it's over. But from now until then, it's no hose bar. Everything's free. Welcome to the best street dedicated to bourbon in the whole United States of America. Bourbon Street the most infamous street in the French Quarter, is a year-round street party. There is no open container law, so people wander from bar to bar drinking alcohol from gold cups. On, on Bourbon Street, everyone is an actor in the elaborate play called Mardi Gras. Try to get the priorities in order, people. It's Bible, Bible, Bible time. <laughs> Mardi Gras 
is not only a huge party, it reflects the exuberant diversity of New Orleans. And that's why it's so beloved by so many people. What Carnival opens up is a world of creativity and fantasy. It's not only the day. The true magic of it lies in what, what I call a perpetual calendar of fantasy. Of preparation, enactment, and of memory. I can remember when I was five and six years old. I could take the little red wagon and put somebody in it and, we'd, and put on some costumes of sorts and we would have a parade in front of the house. I used to go with my father to load the float in Rex's den. And one day I've always said that I wish I could be on the float one day. I was five years old and there was a, I thought, a gorgeous, maybe a six-year-old little girl who was a page to the king on the float. And I fell in love and the next day cut her picture out of the paper and kept it till I was about 12 years old. <laughs> maybe I was six or seven and I'd climb up on the lamppost and I'd plant myself and I'd stand there and I'd dress as a fireman or a cowboy or something and the trick was to use the hat to catch the beads or whatever. My father, when I was a kid, he had the station where he loaded up all the kids in the neighborhood and we'd come down here and play hide-and-go-seek on the floats. Great place to play hide-and-go-seek. Every year, countless new memories of Mardi Gras are created as the party has grown in both popularity and size. No one knows how many people come to Mardi Gras because we don't sell tickets. The only thing we do know is nearly one billion dollars is annually pumped into the economy because of Mardi Gras. With an annual influx of over five million people during Mardi Gras, the city of New Orleans needs to prepare. Their first order of business is to grant parade permits for the numerous New Orleans crews. Then, there is attending to the needs of a population dedicated to drinking. Over 2,000 portable bathrooms are set up around the city. <laughs> then, the city of New Orleans sets up a battle plan to deploy the 1,200 men and women of the New Orleans police force. We have seen over the last several years where crime actually goes down during Mardi Gras. Even the criminals, to a certain extent, are distracted from their normal day-to-day -day duties and responsibilities by the festivities that are going on. Since they're often outnumbered 100 to 1, New Orleans' finest need an advantage in unruly crowd situations. The parties in the French Quarter and along the parade routes make police cars almost obsolete. This is where horses enable the police to respond quickly and with a better view of any disturbance. In the private sector, shops and businesses also need to prepare. Along Bourbon Street, excess is a necessity. Truckloads of kegs, boatloads of seafood, and enough aspirin to handle over a million hangovers. Because of the thousands of partygoers who pack Bourbon Street throughout Mardi Gras, many local hotels have adopted unique forms of crowd control. This hotel becomes literally a war zone. It is a prison. We come in, we do everything from locking up the windows of the hotel. We grease the poles. They go up to the balconies to make sure people don't go up there. As the party continues to rock Bourbon Street, the men and women of the New Orleans Police Department are watching closely. We had a black guy about this. On first glance, a six-block street filled with over 200,000 people in various stages of intoxication would seem like a problem. But the New Orleans police have it well under control. Separate enforcement, 
is the way I would describe it. With the crowds this massive, the type of atmosphere that you have during Mardi Gras, that, that party type of attitude, uh, you would be doing yourself a disservice if you went out there and tried to really play hardball with people. Now, that's not what this is all about. We're out there to maintain order and first and foremost to ensure that people enjoy themselves and they remain injury free. Police do not enter this battle without a plan. Ten officers are deployed at each corner of Bourbon Street. They're in constant communication with mounted police and other field units. Their goal, maintain order. Any type of violent confrontation where someone could get hurt, we address immediately with an arrest. Why did you smack the hump? Don't walk off while I book you for resistance. We have people sometimes urinating in public, uh, fornicating in public, things like that. We'll address that immediately with arrest. Uh, other things, if we can address it with warnings and make sure that it doesn't occur again, we prefer to do that. On average, there are over 700 arrests each Mardi Gras season, mostly for small disturbances. When an arrest is made, the suspects are held in detention vans deployed around the French Quarter. We have sufficient manpower down there to handle anything that happens, and uh, for the most part, people down on Bourbon Street just have a good time. But Bourbon Street has not completely cornered the market on Mardi Gras parties. Oh, that is so One of the most lavish takes place in the city's garden district. Each year, author Anne Rice plays host to friends and celebrities who come to celebrate the Bacchus Night Parade. You can't say Mardi Gras decided to be here. It's like Mardi Gras grew out of what we are. Our love for getting together with loved ones, our love for spectacle, our love to show up, to dance, to listen to music. It's, it's all there. It's all captured in Mardi Gras. For actor Forrest Whitaker, it's a first time Mardi Gras. Oh, the people are great, man. Everybody's having such a blast. Everybody's being really open. It's really beautiful. New Orleans resident Delta Burke feels there is a little child in all of us. If you're a grown-up and you get excited about the blue thing and you're rolling around in the gutter to pick them up, that means that you're a kid and you're just happy and, and you're, you know, you're just having a good time. Four days of preparation. It is the dawn of another Fat Tuesday. Today, both Rex and Zulu will roll through the streets of New Orleans. Traditionally, a Fat Tuesday parade slot is the most coveted. Rex has been marching on this day since 1872, Zulu since 1909. It's 6 a.m., and there are only 18 hours left before the official close of Mardi Gras. Who's left? While the rest of America is still sleeping, the men and women of the Zulu Social Aid and Pleasure Club are continuing a tradition that has lasted 82 years. You got it. <laughs> the black face, which is one of, the, one of the things unique about Zulu was created by the, the, the individuals that founded this organization because they could not afford to buy a mask. And that, that is our trademark. Everybody say Zulu! Zulu! After a traditional breakfast, Zulu members board buses to the parade staging area. It is a peaceful time to reflect on the work behind them and the fun ahead. When Nick Harris and the other members arrive, there is still work to be done. It's going to be a beautiful day. I hope I have enough throws. Zulu was the first integrated crew. They have about 380 members, but about 1,000 riders. And I bet more than a third of their riders are white, even though it's a black group. And uh, they all wear blackface and white gloves, so you really can't tell the, the race of the person beneath the mask. Can anyone have brought in the makeup? They brought the makeup? Majesty, how are you? Good morning. Yeah, I'm doing well, thank you. While the members of Zulu finish their preparations, the members of Rex are beginning to gather at the Claiborne Street Den. As the clock ticks closer to their 10 a.m. parade time, the den begins to buzz with excitement. Jack 
Mike Weinman, chosen Rex of 1996, has lived the excitement of this morning over 40 times. One of my friends uh, uh, asked me, said, what was the biggest thrill on Mardi Gras Day? And I replied, when the den doors opened and my float, the King's float, went out into the sunlight. All of a sudden, the, all this planning comes to fruition. Your Majesty, today you rule over the monarchy of New Orleans. We, the former kings, would like to toast to you and wish you a glorious ride through your city. Hail Rex! Hail Rex! At 8.30 a.m., the parade begins to roll down Claiborne Avenue. You're excited? You get more excited when you see the people below excited to see you. Zulu is one of my favorite parades because I don't know of any organization that has more fun than Zulu. The floats hardly ever match the theme and it really doesn't matter. It's a big parade. It's a gaudy parade. And of course Zulu is famous for its golden coconut and it is the most valuable throw you can get. The coconut, for all its simplicity, is the most intricate of all Mardi Gras throws. The members of Zulu spend months at home shaving and handcrafting their coconuts. Each of the 27 crews within Zulu creates their own unique design. Now, this coconut was created back in early 1900s as the official throw for Zulu. It's decorative, very creative in very different ways. Uh, it's unique in the sense that no other crew has it, but Zulu is our trademark. Ironically, even though coconuts are the most valuable throws at Mardi Gras, by law, they cannot be thrown. It seems that so many people were hit by flying coconuts that the city created a law to protect the people on the receiving end. Today, all coconuts must be handed instead of tossed, but they remain one of Mardi Gras' most enduring symbols. The crew of Rex also has their own traditional throws called doubloons. The doubloons started in 1960 and became an instant hit. People love to catch the doubloons. They look like a coin, bright gold, and a shower of those will make the crowd really scramble to get them. It's 12 hours before the close of Carnival, and the historic Rex parade is on the streets. Although Rex is not the largest parade, it draws some of the biggest crowds. Everyone wants to get a look at the king of Mardi Gras. New Orleans knows how to do this. They know how to do it with a minimum of trouble. I mean, thousands of people gather on St. Charles Avenue for these parades, night after night, and we don't have any problems at all. As Zulu winds down, the members pass out the last of the valued coconuts. Meanwhile, many parade watchers mill down to Bourbon Street to continue the party. There are only six hours left till the close of Mardi Gras, and thousands begin to pack the French Quarter for the final hours of Fat Tuesday. Here, locals and tourists alike feast on Creole and Cajun cooking from some of the finest restaurants in the South. clear signs that this will be one of the biggest party nights of the year. Meanwhile, across town, with just four hours left of the world's greatest party, dazzling sights and sounds fill a massive hall, the setting of the traditional Rex Ball. The traditional balls are connected to the debutante season, and the highest honor a young woman could have is to be a, a maid or a queen of, of one of these balls. The traditional close of the carnival season is when the King of Rex leaves his own ball to visit the King of Comus. It is a century-old tradition, but just because the Mardi Gras royalty has retired does not mean the party is over. As the final hours of Fat Tuesday tick away, the French Quarter pulsates with pure energy. Partygoers look to outdo each other with extreme and obscene acts, each more outrageous than the next. I, I've never done anything like this before. It's pretty crazy. There was a girl who was squirting milk. That's true. I saw three willies. It was like the biggest, baddest, craziest party in like the whole world. The French Quarter just has a lot of atmosphere. Um, a lot of hue and manure circulating on Bourbon Street, that's for sure. I'm sitting here walking around with my jaw 
Claw down saying this is unbelievable. A lot of exposure. <laughs> Mardi Gras is chaos. <laughs> We've got everything out of our system, and now we're ready to uh, get into a little more religion. Mardi Gras officially ends at midnight on Tuesday, which is the beginning of Ash Wednesday, which is the beginning of Lent. It's our responsibility to go down and inform people on Bourbon Street that Mardi Gras is over and that Bourbon Street will be closed and then we do what we call a sweep. What that entails is, uh, first of all, our mounted division and they lead a procession of police vehicles and uh, sanitation vehicles. And we, we sweep the street clear of people and then the sanitation people come in and begin their job of cleanup. Up until a few years ago, we had one of the strangest success barometers in the world for Mardi Gras, and uh, the city weighed all of the trash collected, and the more trash, the more successful Carnival was. It peaked out in, I think, 1984 with 2,000 tons of garbage. Now that we have recycling, we, we're not quite as messy. Wednesday. Thousands of natives flock to the city's historic churches for mass. Outside the church, the city is eerily quiet. Many people return to work knowing the next 40 days will be a penance for the celebration of Mardi Gras. Welcome. As he does after every carnival season, Jack Weinman returns from church on Ash Wednesday to relax with family and friends. This year, there are three generations of Weinmans recounting stories of Mardi Gras. Little Mardi Gras. I don't consider it a pagan wildness. The entertainment that goes with the balls and the parades is so much a part of life here that it, it, the Orleans wouldn't be the same if, if it were not there. The carnival is over, now let's get back to the real part of it, yeah. Nick Harris, director of public relations for Zulu, is also home relaxing. He is with his wife Claire and son Nicholas. <laughs> Neither have seen much of Nick over the last two weeks. I like that, you know, that feeling, that, that rush and that you get when a uh, carnival arrives and then the next day you somewhat feel that emptiness because you know it's not necessary to do anything else right now. I'm complaining every carnival. Oh, it's too much work here. This is too much, and this is too much. But actually, I love it. It's, it's a feeling of, of accomplishment, one that we had a great parade, one that we had a wonderful Mardi Gras, a safe one. Uh, tired, but a, a good tired. Sonny Boré has retired to his Alexandra Street home to enjoy the peace and quiet of Lent. The city always feels the same to me, whether it's Mardi Gras Day or not. There's just something very special about this city. Uh, this is a place that gets in your blood. Uh, you never want to leave here once you, once you live here. But even on this day of rest, the driving mentality of every New Orleanian who grew up with Mardi Gras is clear. You don't have the crowds screaming in your ear. They're still screaming in your heart, though. Parties must never end. It's got to keep continuing. That, that's part of New Orleans also. We will party at any excuse, at the drop of a hat. Uh, this, this morning we had to have our, our final breakfast together. Uh, and start planning next year. I mean, Mardi Gras is less than a year away. T.L. 
TLC continues its evening of the greatest. Get to know the kings and queens of the flying trapeze. They've been defying death for decades. Now see what it's like to live life on the high wire. The Flying Willenders, next from TLC.